God's Word is Matthew 19, 16 through 20. <clears throat> Just then a man came up to Jesus and inquired, Teacher, what good things must I do to obtain eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which one, the man asked. Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, said the young man. What do I still lack? So be it. A prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you have been so rich to us, that you would become flesh and blood, that you would lay down your life for us is just beyond anything that I can comprehend. Lord, we do thank you for your scripture. We thank you for your laws, which are not burdensome, but they are good and wholesome. And we thank you that we have a hope that is built on the finished blood, the finished work of Jesus Christ, that his blood gave us atonement from our sins, ransomed us back. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. We look forward to a place where there is no sin whatsoever, there is no shame, there is no death, there is no disease. Lord, change our hearts, change our minds to think about how richly you have given to us, how much love that you have freely given to us while we were even enemies that Christ died for us. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the time that we can come together, the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we give you thanks for all the rich things that you give us. We, may we have a different thought process than the world to think that the government provides for us or our own physical ability provides for us. But let us realize that each and every day that we have on this earth is a gift of love and grace from you and that you freely feed us and clothe us and everything else, and we have nothing to worry about because we have been drenched by the love of Jesus Christ. As we approach Easter, Lord, let us remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, and let us live for the hope of the resurrection that we have as new creations in Christ. We pray this in His name. Amen. So this is third in a series, and you're probably like, how long is he going to go? Three. <laughs> Because I want to go to a different scripture where Jesus talks about his neighbor again. And this is the theme that the free Methodists have talked about going on this year of the great co commandment to love the Lord your God with all that you have and to love your neighbor as yourself, even as Christ loved, loves you. And the scripture that I had Merle read today will get towards to the end. And if you notice, he asked with a question, what do I still lack? And if you notice... The man's answer at first to Jesus when he asked him about the commandments, all those commandments involved how you live and act towards others. They didn't involve loving your God or anything. They involved how you love others. Because if you truly realize how much God loves you, and it becomes your heart's devotion to love him back because of the things that he has done for you, the love that he has for you. And you can't know love until you understand that God is love and loves you. Then it has to permeate your life to where you love others, where you will keep those commands, where you will think of others above yourself, and where your actions and deeds will even show it. The Greek word for neighbor, I'll remind you again, is called plesion. It's used 17 times. One time it, it's translated as near because it does mean proximity. Because when you think of neighbor, you think of those that are close to you. But that's not just what neighbor means. Neighbor means all of your kinsmen. Even those outside of your kinsmen because we're all created in God's image. It encompasses all of mankind. And it is God's will that all men be saved. 
the offer that He gave freely through Jesus Christ is available to all men. How could we ever be a respecter of persons when God Himself is not? And as you read Scripture, you'll understand even more that Jesus even expounds upon that and says that does include your enemy. And when we hear the story of the Good Samaritan, which we think of the most oftenly with these, with these verses of, of the Great Commandment, we think that that Samaritan to that Judean was, yes, his literal neighbor right next door, but they literally went out of their way to not see each other because they didn't want to have anything to do with each other. And it was over religion of all things. Maybe a valid point, maybe not, but Jesus was saying it's time to love one another, even your enemies. And he tells that story. Most of the times you see the word neighbor, it involves our behavior, how we live, how we act, and it's a result of our mindset and our heart. And Scripture tells us that we need a renewed mind, transformed by the Spirit. Scripture tells us that we need to have the heart and mindset of Jesus Christ. We looked at some of the scriptures to the early churches that Paul wrote and James wrote and so forth, and we saw the same words that Jesus wrote. Then we looked at Mark 12, and we saw that religious teacher of the law who questioned Jesus. And I'm going to break it down this way so you remember each thing. The man's question was, okay, in Mark 12, 28, of all the commandments, which is the most important? This is the man's question of which Jesus is going to answer. Sometimes he clearly answers them. Sometimes it's with a parable, whatever. But Jesus will answer you if you ask him the questions. The man's question is, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus' answer, pretty clear. The next three verses, the most important one Jesus answered is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The basic commandments of the Ten Commandments, to love the Lord your God and have no other, to thank Him, to hold His name sacred, to give Him honor and glory that He deserves. He is God and He created you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the mind you won't find as much in the Old Testament, but it's implied there, and the reason that Jesus says it now is in that day and age, and even more today, we have this mind concept that we can do these things and, and so forth. And, th and that makes us less dependent on God, less thankful for the things that God has given us. It sets ourselves more up on the throne rather than taking ourselves off the throne, not only to love the Lord our God, but to serve a new king, not the devil, but Jesus Christ who is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And we look at the, the New Testament, especially the Gospels, and we see the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom mentioned over and over again. Because the kingdom of God is in our midst. It started when Jesus Christ came. My little scripture thing from this week, I don't know if I have it here or not, got me thinking. I don't, there we go. Because I don't remember reading the King James this way. It was from Luke 17, 21. It said, The kingdom of God is within you. And I just got my mind thinking again. Because I think more of among, because that's what most of the translations are. The kingdom of God is among you. The Spirit is here on earth. We are a royal priesthood. But you know, the word literally is within. It does mean among. It means it permeates everything. But it also is the opposite an antonym, right? Yeah, an antonym. I get it right. Of without. It's not without you. It is within you. That transforming power of the Spirit. And it was just so refreshing reading this translation of just one simple verse and realizing that the kingdom of God is not only among us, it's within us. That just blowed me away, and that's what I meditated on this week as I got away from my own time and my own self and, and put time for God, because we constantly do that. To finish Jesus' answer, though, He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second, He put this in there, 
is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment, singular, because it encompasses both, but he specifically said first and second, greater than these. You can't have one without the other. You can't have ice cream without a spoon, right? I guess you could, but... A cone, but you need a spoon to put it there. <laughs> now... The man's question was, of all the commandments, which is the greatest? Jesus gives his answer. Here's the man's understanding. Because so many times we understand something, but yet we let it go in one ear, out the other. We don't process it. We say, oh, that's good and dandy. We don't act on it, whatever it is. Here's, here's one so prevalent in the church. I'll pray for you. You have the understanding that the person came to you with a prayer request. You can make your petitions to God, but do you faithfully do it? And I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just using it as an example. And whenever I do, I'm telling you my own shortcomings if you don't know that. Because it doesn't permeate me as much as it should. I pray about it when I think about it rather than sitting down and making time to pray about it because I'm concerned more about my neighbor than I am myself. No, in my life, I'm more concerned about myself and getting everything done, and then I forget to pray about my neighbor. The man's understanding was this, verse 32 and 33. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him, to love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he adds this to it because he has the understanding. It's more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. You can be as works-oriented, as legalistic, whatever it is, and be far from the kingdom of God. Because you do the things that you do, and that's why I gave you the example of praying for someone else, because they mean something to me. It drives and motivates me because of God's love that compels me to do it. And it takes me taking myself out of the equation more so that I can take up my cross, whatever it is, and follow after Jesus. Jesus responded again to the man, verse 34. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to them this, You are not far from the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here because Emmanuel, God, dwells with us. We are offered forgiveness, redemption, grace, love, and eternal life if we'll accept King Jesus. He equates it to a kingdom. And you do serve one king or another. That chapter ended with a warning that from Jesus to not be like the scribes, the religious leaders of the day. And there was a real life experience of a widow who gave two mites almost nothing, but it's all she had. What an example to end that chapter. She was willing to give everything even though it seemed like what could that little amount do? Why? Because she loved the Lord her God with all of her heart, mind, soul, strength. What did she give the money for? Whatever it was to help others. She gave it out of a pure heart, not knowing what it would be used for. Last week we looked at Jesus' words from Luke 10 where Jesus had sent out 70 or 72 disciples to go and announce His coming. They pledged their allegiance to King Jesus. They were commissioned, empowered, and sent. And I reminded you that so are we. The Great Commission is not just for the 12, it's not for the 70. It is for every follower of Jesus Christ. All those who decide that Jesus is King, they want God's gift, and they decide to pledge their allegiance to King Jesus and do His bidding until He returns. And that chapter starts out with the harvest is plentiful, but a contrast. The workers are few. Then he goes on to say, to, to tell them to pray, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. They go out. They return joyfully. Their report is this. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Great news. Success however you want to say it. Something exciting is happening in the kingdom. 
But Jesus tells them, that's not why you're to rejoice. That's a wonderful thing, and don't be surprised about it. Jesus' response, nothing will harm you, verse 19. Verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but instead rejoice that your names are written in heaven. If you believe in Jesus Christ, your name is written in heaven, and no one can blot that out. You belong to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. You are citizens living in a foreign world, and you are ambassadors in this foreign world to live for King Jesus. That means the Scripture tells us so many times we have to change our mind, to change our actions, so that we live as foreigners and exiles in this world. Loving others over ourselves, living a set-apart holy life, where when given the opportunity, because people see a difference in us, that they ask us about the hope that we have, and we can tell them. That leads into a story that another religious expert of the law asked Jesus a question. The man's question is, the man's question is, remember the first one, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now this man's question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 25. So Jesus has already answered what is the greatest commandment, and he's given two commandments. He, now this man asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a little different. Jesus throws the question back on him. Jesus' question back in verse 26 is, what is written in the law? How do you read it? I emphasize you, right? Because if you understand this and you don't do it, then are you really hearing and obeying? Are you really living for the kingdom of God or some other kingdom? The man's understanding was this, verse 27. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he understands the law. But will he do it? Oh, and that's a spiritual battle we fight, isn't it? We know that. And we have to put on God's armor, but with God's armor we can, ex we can extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil. That requires a transformed mind, which requires a transformed heart. It requires constant feeding on the Word of God, denying myself. I can go on and on and on. But we are new creations in Jesus Christ. Let the Spirit transform you through and through. Let the Spirit compel you. Don't blaspheme the Spirit or do things against the Spirit because you want your will more than the Father's will. How does that prayer go? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Jesus reigns here on earth. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And we're privileged to usher in Jesus' physical reign. Every day we talk about it getting worse and worse and worse is just that day closer to Jesus truly physically reigning here on earth. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to it. Am I looking forward to what happens in the meantime getting there? No. <laughs> but I know that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength because Paul tells me that as he's in prison writing these letters to the churches. And when he writes to Timothy, one young man, he says, don't worry about me, don't fear death. You fight the good fight, you finish the race. Don't let anything sway you from that. Jesus' response to the man because of his understanding, his stated understanding. Verse 28, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. What was his question? What must I do to have eternal life? Jesus' answer, do this and you will live. What is he to do? Do his understanding of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength and loving your neighbor. Not talking about it, 
Not doing it here and there, not doing it begrudgingly, but let it be your life because of the love that you have, because of God's love for you. How can you live any other way? Every time we don't want to forgive, we're going against the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We're not doing His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, this has a man's second question, doesn't it? Because he wanted to justify himself. Who then is my neighbor? Of which Jesus responds with a parable. Here's the thing about parables again. Parables aren't going to mean anything to you if you don't really have the first understanding because they're a further teaching illustration that's so commonplace and so easy to understand, but you're not going to get it if you're over here fighting the principle in the first place. So the man did not want to love his neighbor. That's understood in the story. How many times have I, I'll use myself again, not wanted to love or forgive someone? Sorry, but I'm guilty. And Jesus is clear with his story that even your enemy is your neighbor. That that love is offered to all mankind. And you are Jesus' hands and feet, His agents, His ambassadors, whatever you want to use. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, and then Jesus asks a second question of the man. So you've got to start putting yourself in His shoes here and answer these questions yourself. The second question of Jesus is verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The man's understanding was this. Twice he's had to tell Jesus what his understanding is, but will he do it? Verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. Something he did not deserve, but because I had compassion for him, pity for him, love for him, I gave to him to fill his need. Did it cost me something? Sure. How much did it cost me? It might have cost me everything. It might not have cost me that much. It might have given out of my abundance. It might have been like the woman who gave all she had to live on. But it was driven by love, mercy, and grace. What is my answer in this story? What will I do? Well, I can tell you right off, it's easier if this person's my friend. <laughs> it's easier here if they're just a slight little enemy. It gets hard over here. It gets hard to do. It means I need to deny myself even more, take up my cross even more, and follow after Jesus. And why would this bother me so much? Because I was the enemy of Christ when He died for me. And now I am a friend. I am a brother. I have eternal life. He calls me His own. I hear His voice and I won't respond to another. Jesus responds to the man again, go and do likewise. Twice the man gets, if you don't go do it, you don't really understand it. You're not hearing and obeying. This chapter ends, I don't remember if I'd said this part or not, ends with worship. It ends with Martha and Mary. And Martha is caught up in the doing of Jesus getting the meal ready, doing everything. She's doing it for Jesus, but she forgets the side of the worship where Mary's at His feet. And there's a time for both. Don't get caught up in the just doing. Get caught up in loving God and loving others. And then you will naturally do. Don't forget to worship God, to love Him with all of your heart mind, soul, body, and strength. Because if that's not there, you're never going to love your neighbor as yourself. Today we're going to go to the final time that Jesus uses the word neighbors. Three times in the book of Matthew. His first words are in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 38. You have heard it said... Because we've got to change this way of thinking, even for what we've read in the Old Testament, because Jesus expounds upon it. That's why you hear so much where people say, well, I just don't see how the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Yes, you do if you understand His love. That He is a holy, righteous God who should not be approachable, but is, because He wants a relationship with you. 
And because we are such filthy creatures, His holiness has sacrificed His life for us so that we can be holy, sanctified, set apart, that we can be new creations in Jesus Christ, so that we can live as we could never live before. Satan has no power over your destiny. He has no power over your life now. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You have heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Yeah, this is getting over here to this side, isn't it? <laughs> if someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you, and take your tunic, then give him your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give the one who asks, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have also heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. If you don't think that the neighbor equates to enemies, right there it does. Right there from Scripture, not my words. And pray for those who persecute you. That you may be what? Sons of your Father in heaven. True children of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He is the one who causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. And sends out um, stimulus checks, just saying. The reason I say that, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. So many people will thank the government. Thank God for everything that is in your life. Monetary, yes. Relationships, yes. The breath of life you have, the ability to function. Something happened to me this week, and I don't even know what happened, and who knows, and it reminded me of... John, when he worked for us, one day he was putting up carb kits on the wall. They're little plastic envelope kits. And he was dropping them. The next day he comes back from the doctor and says, I have good news and bad news. I don't remember what the good news was right now because I remember the bad news. The bad news is I got cancer. And one year later, maybe not even that long, he was gone. Wednesday, I don't know what happened to me. I pushed my chair back because my stomach hurt. I weighed my way to the bathroom. I didn't make it. I fell short, lay there on the floor for a while, and then Nathan hollered out and said, are you okay? I'm like, no. I don't know what happened. But I sat there on the floor and thanked God for the life I had and any that I would have after this because we are in no control of our lives, over our body functions, over what happens in this world, nothing else. The freedom that we have, the oxygen that we breathe, the finances we have are all a grace, a gift from God. Live your life for King Jesus if you truly know Him. I got a mark on my shoulder, I guess, where I hit the floor. And then Nathan showed me the next day where I hit the little uh, storage cabinet by the toilet. I was trying to make it to the toilet in case I threw up. <laughs> my shoulder went through that cabinet. I had no idea. <laughs> One minute, everything is fine. One minute, it's not. Are you really in control of anything? Can you really afford to not thank God for all the wonderful things that He's given you? He is God. Love the Lord your God with everything that you have. And love your neighbor as yourself. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and good, and He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only brothers, what are you doing more, for, doing more than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's our goal. As children of the kingdom of heaven, sons of God, we are to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. Now, don't misunderstand the word. You need to know some of the meaning of the word. It means complete, lacking nothing, mature. Yes, we think of it's not having any error in us, any sin in us, 
But you know what? As the Spirit, as you die to yourself and the Spirit empowers you and dwells through you, you will sin less and less and less. When we get to heaven, will there be any sin? Why should we not let the Spirit transform us through and through and sanctify us through and through on our journey there? And we don't know if we have a minute left or years left. The last words of Jesus found in Matthew 22, after He discusses uh, paying taxes and whether or not the res resurrection takes place, a Pharisee came up and asked Him the question, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus' answer, so I've skipped to Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. Now this time Jesus adds to these words that he's already said. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything. If you didn't get it before, everything here says that you should have a life of holiness where you love God and thank Him for everything and it permeates everything about you so that you do then love your neighbor because you can't help but do that. Do you hear and obey? Hear, O oh, hear, O oh, Israel. Do you love the Lord your God with everything? And do you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? How about as much as Jesus loves you? But we're supposed to be perfect, mature, complete, lacking nothing, as our Heavenly Father is. Is anything competing for your love? Is anything stopping you from loving the Lord your God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself? All the law and all the prophets speak of this. In the middle of these teachings is the third time for Matthew that Jesus uses the word neighbor. It's found in Matthew 19. You've heard the story many, many, many times. There's a young rich ruler who has everything. So let's break this down like we did the other. The man does not seem to be a hypocrite like the religious leaders of the law are, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. He seems to be a righteous man. But our righteousness, no matter what it seems like, is nothing but filthy rags. Your righteousness will only take you straight to hell. Jesus' righteousness will cover every blemish, every stain. You have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. You are a child of God. You have been restored to a right relationship. You have been sealed and empowered by the Spirit. So let Him transform you. The first man asked, what was the greatest commandment? The second man asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now let's look at this story. This man's question is, Teacher, what must good thing must I do to obtain eternal life? Obtain simply means have. It doesn't imply that you're doing anything to get it. It implies the responsibility that you have because you have it. Okay, big, big, big difference. So let's back up just a hair before we get there. Verse 14 of Matthew 19. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. All you need to do is have childlike faith. I don't understand it all, but I love you, God, because you love me. I, ha I can't love my neighbor, but I will try by your power and your grace to love even my enemies. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Verse 16, I don't know how your translation starts, but mine that I copied here says, just then. It means that at that exact moment, 
a man walks up to ask Jesus this question. Coincidence, right? No. The little children are there. The disciples don't want them there. They think it's a hindrance. And Jesus says this. Knowing that that little child doesn't worry about where his food comes from, his protection comes from, anything else. And when he goes off with his father, it's the greatest day of his life. If his daddy throws him up in the air, he doesn't worry about his daddy catching him. He just wants to be with his dad because he loves his dad and he knows his dad loves him and everything is fine. And if you have that kind of faith, the kingdom of heaven is for such as you. So at that moment, or just then, a man came up to Jesus and inquired. The man's question was, Teacher, what good thing must I do to obtain or have eternal life? Let me remind you of Matthew chapter 5. Be perfect, mature, complete, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This man encountered Jesus, and the man's question was, Teacher, what good thing must I do? I know I have a moral responsibility. What must I do to have eternal life? Jesus' response is in verse 17. Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who is good, and if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So what's he saying there? Why are you asking me? Do you recognize that I am the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the one who will save their people from their sins? Because that's what Jesus is telling them. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. Is this what you believe? If you do, you know the commandments, and you know that you are a wretched sinner, and you can't keep the commandments. So you have no hope whatsoever, do you? But you do. Because God has fulfilled His promise to you and the Messiah is standing in front of you. Now we know even more. We know that Christ died while we were still His enemies. And that He rose from the dead. And that He said that He would return for us. Wow, what more information do we have to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, body, and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves? The man's response, which commands? He understands the commands, but he doesn't understand the whole thought process here. Jesus' response, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steer, do not bear false witnesses, honor your mother and father and... Love your place, Sion, there's the, the term, as yourself. All commands related to the, how you act to others because you've loved the Lord your God and not had other gods before Him. Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship with His Spirit, any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love. Being united in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, and this man obeyed the commandments, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act on behalf of His good purposes. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in this crooked and perverse generation. 
in which you shine as lights in the world, as you hold forth the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. These, man, these words written by a man who used to conform to the law. He obeyed all the commandments. But they distorted his view because he did not love his neighbor. Instead, he persecuted them. Maybe took his hand in actually killing them. Maybe just stood aside and watched it happen and said it was fine. But Jesus changed him radically. Totally. A new creation in Christ that he can write these words that echo Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 5. And this reminds me so much of this man that's here that day before Jesus that just happened to be there out of coincidence, right? No. Jesus' response to the man. Because he said, I've kept all these. Let me remind you that. If you want to be perfect, complete, Go sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. This one's tough. That means you've got to get rid of every other God before Him. Every other security, everything else. Does it mean literally? Maybe. I'll throw that out there. How's that? Maybe. Does it mean it if you have other gods before Him? Yes. Does it mean you have to go sell all your riches? No, Abraham didn't. And Abraham was a righteous man. He always thought about what he could do, at least what we see in Scripture, for other people. Even when Lot set his eyes on Sodom and Gomorrah, he still gave him that land. It doesn't, riches aren't a bad thing. Don't take the story this way whatsoever. But in this man's life, His riches meant more to him than Jesus Christ did that day. And Jesus calls him out and says, You've kept the law. I'm not going to argue with you about that. Did he keep everyone? No, we know that he didn't. Everyone sins. And the wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the man wasn't willing to give them up. He had other loves, other passions. And Jesus wasn't passionate enough to him. You can't help but put yourself in the shoes of this man. At least I can't. Verse 22. When the young man heard this, he went away in sorrow because he had great wealth. Now you can read two other accounts in Scripture about this to get more insight on it. This was a man who appeared to be very righteous. He wasn't hypocritical. He wasn't condemning. He had done the law. If anyone looked like he's got it together, this guy did. Well, let's go on and remember his question. The question question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And his understanding was, I need to do something. Tell me what it is, Jesus. And Jesus told him. But he wasn't willing to do it. Remind you of more words from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And a few verses later, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve. Mammon, riches, treasure, your heart's desire, whatever it is, if it's not God. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus' response to his true disciples. See how this is different? Because Jesus now turns his conversation to his true disciples because the man has gone away. He's rejected Jesus. The man's response to the disciples... As Jesus said to His disciples, Truly I do tell you this, it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's impossible, Scripture goes on to tell us. So the disciples' question was, Who then can be saved? If this man walked away, there's no hope for the rest of us. This guy, they may have known him, I I don't know. 
This guy did it. But he didn't have love for God. And he wasn't willing to sell everything to love others. Because Jesus said, give it to the poor. Then come follow me. Give it to those that don't have. Jesus' response to his disciples, verse 26. Jesus looked at them. And that means he looked at them with love and with compassion. He looked at them lovingly and said, With man this is impossible. Here's one of those big buts. <laughs> but with God all things are possible. Even for you to sell everything you have, give it to the poor so that you can follow me. The disciples' response was this. From Peter, but we'll call it the disciples' response. Look! We have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? Now, Jesus didn't have to answer him, but he did. Jesus' third response to his true disciples. He's already told them it's hard, it's hard. He's told them it's impossible for man, but possible with God. And now his third response is this. Truly I tell you in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne... He, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones judging in tw the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, here you go, we can't say this is just for the disciples, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for the sake of my name will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Now you may disagree with me on how I'm going to say this verse and that's fine. But the way the scripture reads, again, I don't have to hate my mother. There's other scriptures that tell me I don't have to do that. But if my love for my mother drives me more and compels me more than God's love, something's wrong with that. Okay? Same way with the fields or the riches or anything else. But the way I read this, if you give up for Jesus where He is the greatest love in your life, then you at the renewal of all things, will inherit eternal life. But if you read the scripture carefully, you will receive a hundredfold and then will inherit eternal life. Now, is Jesus talking about monetary things again? No. Is he talking about family and friends? No. He's talking about the joy that you have, the peace that you have. Because in this life, if you were willing to sell everything that you have so that you could and give it to the poor, so that then you, you could come and follow Jesus, you'd have a hundredfold. You'd be so much richer than the riches you thought you had. If you had a million dollars before, you're going to have a hundred million? A hundred times. A <laughs> hundred million blessings, joy, peace, whatever it is in your life. Now, whether the hundredfold is... is literal or whatever it is, loving the Lord your God is so much greater than loving money. You can't serve both. Mammon, things, materialistic things. Are you thanking God and realizing that they're not yours in the first place? There are riches from Him. The church realized that. And in Acts you read that they, there were some that sold everything that they had and shared it with people that didn't because they considered what they had not to be their own. It was a gift from God, so they were rich in mercy and grace and love for others since they were richly given by God. Is anything keeping you from loving Jesus, from loving God with everything? And does that reflect in how you love your neighbors? Jesus knows it's impossible for you but everything is possible with God. Even changing an ain't into a saint. Changing a wretched, pitiful, naked, blind person into a shepherd that hopefully shepherds you. Because he's compelled by the love of God through Jesus Christ. And the rest of this world is fading away. It doesn't mean as much. Because Jesus means everything. The disciples' understanding was give up everything and follow Jesus. He holds the word to eternal life. How can we not? Let that be motivation for you to not cling to this world, but instead to cling to Jesus.
Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the love of Jesus. As we, we, in your love, Father, that's just as I can't describe. It's, words don't even, aren't there. That you would send your one and only Son. That he wouldn't have the things of this world that we treasure so much. Because he loved us. Even as enemies, even as sinners, even as wretched people who did not want him, that spit in his face and mocked him, he wanted your will to be done, your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And he wanted me to be in a right relationship with you because you love me. Lord, help us to love you with all that we have. And help us to love others. Help us to live a life that shows this so that we can be a light to this world. Not hidden, not watered down, but burning brightly because of how brightly Jesus lived and died for us. And Lord, we also thank you and praise you that we know that Jesus rose from the dead and that he will return to claim his own. What a glorious hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen.